Hello, everyone, and welcome to our year-end EOC Strategy and Litigation Review for 2024 webinar. My name is Jerry Mapman, and I am pleased to join my colleagues this afternoon. I'd like to introduce Alex Karasik, a member of the Dwayne Morris Chicago office. Alex has handled litigation throughout the United States and speaks, lectures, and writes on the latest trends involving everything EEOC-centric. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Jerry. Glad to be here. Also on our panel today is Jennifer Riley. Jen is a partner in the Dwayne Morris Chicago office and is the vice chair of our class action group. Jen is also the co-author of the Dwayne Morris Class Action Review and EEOC Litigation Review. Jen has defended companies in government enforcement actions across the country for more than two decades and regularly defends EEOC pattern and practice lawsuits. Thanks, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. We'll start our program today by hearing from Jerry, who chairs the Dwayne Morris Class Action Defense Group. Jerry has confronted and defended some of the largest and most complex EEOC systemic cases ever filed against corporate America. This includes the largest enforcement action ever brought in the history of the EEOC, EEOC versus Sterling Jewelers, which Jerry defended and settled for no money. Jerry also led our defense team in EEOC versus Kaplan, where we won on summary judgment at the district court level and then prevailed in the Sixth Circuit. This is one of the EEOC's most famous losses in a nationwide systemic case in what the Wall Street Journal called the opinion of the year. Jerry has probably handled and defended more EEOC lawsuits than any other lawyer in the United States. The EEOC actually asked him to speak at its annual training academy for EEOC lawyers. Thanks so much, uh, Jen. Uh, we have an ambitious agenda today in terms of the area we're going to cover in our 30 minutes together. We came up with these five data points that we thought were key for you to understand what's going on at the EFC and what's apt to occur uh, in the coming year. We're going to talk about cases filed throughout the EEOC system and an analysis of those lawsuit filings, what it means for corporate America, some of the most notable cases filed over the past year, what the EEOC has done in terms of setting its strategic plan, and then our prognostications in terms of what's ahead and on the enforcement horizon with the change of political parties in the White House. Jen, over to you. So this slide shows the EEOC's filing activity over each of its past five fiscal years. The EEOC's fiscal year extends from October through September. So its fiscal year 2024, for instance, spanned from October 1, 2023 to September 30, 2024. The EEOC's filing patterns in 2024 remained fairly consistent with prior years, as you can see from the slide, both in terms of the numbers and the timing of the lawsuit filings. We saw a low number of filings through June of 2024, followed by a slight increase in July, another slight increase in August, and then a significant jump in September of 2024. Of the 110 total filings this past fiscal year, more than half, 67 total, were filed in the month of September. We can view the EEOC's enforcement activities similar to the way we, we view real estate. Location, location, location is everything when it comes to analyzing the filings and the litigation trends of the EEOC. While we often refer to the agency as an it, a single governmental agency, when it comes to enforcement actions, a more apt term may be they, given that the EOC operates through a series of district offices that vary in terms of the case types, the priority focus areas, and the number of filings that they pursue each year. In addition to tracking the total number of filings, we closely monitor each of those EEOC 15 district offices in terms of following which is the most active in terms of case filings each year and what their priorities are. Some districts, needless to say, tend to be more aggressive than others, and certain ones focus on different case filing priorities. While filings across the board were down in 2023, we saw jumps in certain district offices, such as Atlanta, which filed 11 lawsuits compared to nine during fiscal year 2023. In contrast, Philadelphia had a significant decrease in filings. After amassing about 19 in fiscal year 2023, Philadelphia had only 14 lawsuits in 2024. 
filings by the New York New York office also fell in 2020. Um, compared, we had 10 in 2023 to compared to seven in 2024. Los Angeles also fell. It filed 10 in fiscal year 2023 compared to zero in fiscal year 2024. Um, Chicago and Indianapolis remained fairly steady near the top again uh, over both years with 11 filings each last year, um, down from 13 filings the year before. So in sum, although filing trends um, were down across the board, um, the activity in various um, district offices remained quite strong in terms of what we've seen historically. Another measure is we look at the types of filings. And as this bar chart demonstrates, disability, gender, and retaliation were the three most popular types of claims alleged by the EEOC. It's somewhat reflective of the EEOC's shifting priorities in terms of what is important in terms of the types of enforcement activities that the government wants to undertake. I see press release after press release and posting after posting on the EEOC newsroom about the issue of pay equity, yet these numbers don't lie. There were only two cases involving pay equity that the EEOC brought. So it's clearly an area the EEOC is talking about, but the EEOC is not bringing lawsuits in this particular area. Um, ADA disability includes mental health, and this is a emerging area that the EEOC has talked about a lot, and this probably accounted for the fact as to why ADA suits probably topped uh, the bar chart. We also looked at the statutes and compared fiscal year 2023 to fiscal year 2024, and once again, Title VII made up the lion's share of the cases. Last year, 61% of the cases as compared to 69% and 68 respectively in the two fiscal years prior thereto. ADA cases also made up the second most popular type of case at 41%, and actually that grew as compared to percentages in the mid-30s in the two previous years. There was a downward trend in age discrimination cases, only six filed uh, last year, half the number of the year before, and probably the renewed emphasis here was on pregnancy discrimination cases, likely because of the passage of the new uh, statute that we're going to talk about. We also look at key industries. If you are in the hospitality, healthcare, or retail industries, you are in the three industries targeted the most by the EEOC. If you look over the last 24 months, those particular industries also were the three most popular industries that were targeted by the EEOC. In particular, the hospitality industry, where there's uh, a bit of summer hiring or hiring of teenagers, seen the most growth, especially with workplace harassment cases. In 2024, in the fiscal year, the EEOC filed five PWFA lawsuits this confirms that pregnancy discrimination was, is, and continue to will be a strategic priority for the EEOC. As we can see from the five lawsuit case captions listed here, these lawsuits were filed across the country in places like Kentucky, Oklahoma, Alabama, Maryland, and Florida, or from a bigger picture level, circuits such as the Sixth Circuit, Tenth Circuit, Eleventh Circuit, and Fourth Circuit. What does this mean? This means that the EEOC is interested in creating case law precedent in all of those circuits regarding uh, pregnant, pregnant workers. In addition, it also shows that these types of cases are industry proof and they affect companies of all shapes and sizes. Here you have companies in the manufacturing industry, in the uh, resort property, uh, and other nursery companies. So examples are different companies in different industries getting sued in these pregnant worker lawsuits. In terms of key case rulings, this case is an interesting one, EEOC versus Total System Services. Here, this case involved an employee who made repeated requests for an accommodation due to being a heightened COVID risk. On this webinar several years ago, we predicted that following the pandemic, there would be an uptick of COVID-related lawsuits, primarily in the spaces of disability discrimination, as Jerry mentioned, which is a hot area now, as well as re uh, religion. And here, this is one example of a case where an employee requests an accommodation to work from home due to heightened COVID risk. The court granted in part and denied in part a motion for summary judgment 
Uh, but I think the key takeaway here is a lot of those COVID cases that were percolating up through uh, the EEOC charge phase over the last couple of years are now entering courtrooms across the country. Another important EEOC case that we thought uh, warranted your attention just came down the pike two weeks ago. It's a case from New York involving uh, a request by both a union, a defendant in the case, and the EEOC to terminate a consent decree, of course, under uh, Title VII and the statutes administered by the EEOC. Any settlement takes the form of a consent decree, and courts have to approve it, and they often include programmatic uh, relief, and the court monitors the defendant's adherence to the obligations in the consent decree. We all know from history, it took Dwight Eisenhower uh, a year and a half to plan the D-Day invasion. Here, he could have planned that invasion 35 times because this consent decree is over 50 years old. It's the longest running litigation in the federal court system. Um, it was entered in 1971. The consent decree required the uh, union uh, and employers uh, that had collective bargaining union uh, agreements with the union to engage in uh, targeted hiring and recruitment of Black and Hispanic uh, union members and to provide them with work. Um, after 51 years, both the EEOC and the union asked the court to terminate the consent decree. Surprisingly, the court said no. Uh, that neither the union nor the EEOC had done its job and had sufficiently carried out the purposes of the consent decree. It underscores an EEOC litigation that once a case is settled, it's not necessarily over, and that a court will scrutinize and have jurisdiction over the ability uh, and the efforts undertaken by uh, the settling employer to carry out the purposes of the consent decree. Let's look at EEOC versus Center One. So in 2024, the EEOC obtained only two notable appellate court rulings. That's one of the lowest single year tallies we've seen. It went one for two in terms of its success rate. Uh, the win for the EEOC came from the Third Circuit in this case. The EEOC brought suit on behalf of a Jewish employee who claimed that his employer Center One denied him time off for religious holidays and that forced him to quit. The district court actually entered an order granting summary judgment for the employer center one and the third circuit reversed that ruling. Although the third circuit agreed that accrual of attendance points alone did not constitute an adverse employment action, it found that because center one required the employee to work on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, unless he could produce an official letter from his congregation, so a reasonable jury, the court ruled, could have found that Center One's conduct created an intolerable work environment. In the second of those appellate court rulings, the Seventh Circuit issued a lengthy 82-page opinion in EEOC versus Village at Hamilton Point, um, wherein it affirmed an order granting summary judgment against the EEOC in a systemic race discrimination case. The Seventh Circuit ruled that the EEOC failed to present evidence of racial harassment that was so severe or pervasive so as to alter the conditions of employment for certain claimants. Alex, over to you on our next topic, which are the strategic plans of the EEOC. Yeah, every four years, the EEOC prepares a strategic plan. Essentially, what this does is it comes up with the formula for the EEOC to guide its internal operations and, and discusses the ways that the EEOC will do its job to enforce its anti-discrimination laws. And looking at the 2022 to 2026 strategic plan, I think the first thing we need to do is take it with a grain of salt. As you may or may not have heard, the U.S. will have a new president, President Donald Trump. And then when Donald Trump is coming into office, one of the first things that he may do or that those who he's involved with in the EEOC is potentially put this strategic plan through the shredder. This was created under a different administration and will probably geared towards different goals. A couple of the goals at the bottom here, for instance, poised to expand capacity to prosecute systemic lawsuits and identifying and, and attacking systemic discrimination 
It remains to be seen whether those will be key priorities for the Trump administration. Systemic lawsuits are often ones that are large, it could be hundreds or thousands of people. They target an industry or target a big you know, nationwide company. And uh, those types of lawsuits, it, it, it likely will not be prosecuted um, as much by the, the incoming administration as they could have been by the current administration. So our sense is that the strategic plan, uh, while they're important in theory, uh, when a new administration comes in, it might get thrown out the door. Here is a drill down into the strategic enforcement priorities of which there are six. And as to Alex points, uh, I've been dealing with the EEOC for 42 years, and I've dealt with the EEOC under Republican administrations and under Democratic administrations. And I think sometimes employers forget that there are civil service, career long employees working at the EOC that are there to do their job. And as umpires do in Major League Baseball to call balls and strikes. And they're going to bring the cases and they're going to execute on the statutory authority of the EOC, no matter who is in the White House. And believe it or not, there are ba basically attorneys at the EOC and administrators at the EOC that are going to do what they're going to do. And uh, theoretically, the White House can't really control them and tell them what to do. And so you're going to have a struggle and a yin and yang between policymakers at the top and those who carry out policies in the field. And as Jen had described in looking at all the district offices, you're going to have different uh, administrators and attorneys in those district offices doing different things. But the six things that they're all going to have uppermost in their mind are the six priorities in this strategic enforcement uh, program. It's probably good politics, apple pie, uh, and the like to talk about eliminating barriers to recruitment and hiring to allow uh, as many Americans to have jobs as possible. That's probably not a very uh, controversial strategic enforcement plan. The protecting vulnerable workers may well be. Uh, that typically involves people that don't have English as their primary language, who might earn the minimum wage, and people coming across the border. This may be tied up with some of the immigration politics and immigration enforcement that we're apt to see starting in January of 2025. I believe that the strategic enforcement priority that's most at risk uh, is number three, and these are uh, developing issues. This is where the EEOC would press the envelope and try to expand Title VII and take on controversial positions. This is the one where I can see policymakers appointed by uh, the new president to peel back, so to speak, what the EEOC had been doing before. Number four talks about equal pay. We talked about the number of lawsuits. The EEOC talks about it. Uh, but they don't back it up typically in bringing the number of lawsuits. Number five, preserving access to the legal system is all about retaliation. That was one of the three most popular lawsuits uh, filed by the EEOC. I don't see that changing. And number six, systemic uh, harassment, be it race, gender, uh, religion, age, whatever it may be. Uh, this is the bread and butter of the EEOC, and I don't see that going away anytime soon either. So as Alex had mentioned, uh, the big bugaboo for corporate America is when the EEOC files lawsuits over systemic discrimination. I've described this before as uh, like holding the tail of a tiger uh, that's very hungry, very, very difficult when the weight of the federal government and the EEOC comes down upon a corporation and brings claims on behalf of hundreds, if not thousands of individuals. Alex had mentioned the case that I had defended, uh, the largest in the history of the ESC, 77,000 claimants, a case that went on for over a decade, a very, very difficult situation for that employer in terms of litigating over that many claims uh, against the federal government. Of the 144 lawsuits filed the year before, 25 were systemic cases. Last year of the 110, 13 were systemic cases. This is an area uh, imbued with politics, typically Republicans uh, in the Senate uh, that are holding hearings on the EEOC and on their budget, talk about systemic lawsuits as waste of money, involve lots of people, cost lots of money, spend a lot of time in the court system, 
And they're always asking what sort of bang for the buck is the taxpayer getting for the EEOC bringing those sorts of cases. So many, many things in flux, many things to think about in terms of the future of the EEOC's uh, direction here. And speaking of the future, Jerry, I think one of the things that the EEOC has been paying attention to closely is artificial intelligence. The commission launched its fairness, artificial intelligence and fairness initiative in 2021. And over the last three years, this has increasingly become a prime focus area for the commission. Uh, former Commissioner Keith Sonderling uh, wrote and spoke around the world about uh, artificial intelligence and its potential impact on employment discrimination, particularly in the recruiting and hiring processes. Many of us are familiar with the EEOC's first AI-related settlement in the iTutor case, but here there's another recent case that's caught the eye of uh, many artificial intelligence uh, constituents. In Mobley v. Workday, the EEOC filed a motion for leave to file an amicus brief in regards to a motion to dismiss. And this is following Workday's original motion to dismiss, which was successfully granted. And I think the takeaway from this is that the EEOC is paying attention to AI initiated litigation around the country, not necessarily only cases that it files itself, but other uh, AI related cases that are filed by the private plaintiff side bar. Uh, the EEOC is watching these cases and the EEOC is concerned that many businesses are, are using AI uh, perhaps recklessly by simply turning to the technology without auditing and really checking actually what it's doing and making sure that the technology that's used in AI is not coming up with a discriminatory output when employers turn to it to filter through resumes or decide who or may or may not get a raise and other employment functions that may be enhanced by AI. So I think businesses that are using AI need to pay careful attention to make sure that they're auditing their processes because artificial intelligence discrimination is squarely on the radar of the EEOC. The EEOC also previously announced some goals for DEI. This has become a major focal point, not only in American mainstream society, but also in the legal system. Whether you turn on the news or listen to recent art, look at recent articles about Supreme Court rulings, DEI is everywhere. And while the prior administration uh, seemed to be focused on DEI, as Jerry mentioned, in the incoming administration, there would be certain policymakers who may not have an interest in certain uh, aspects that the prior administration was focused on. DEI is likely one of them. Based on things that most of us have seen and heard from the incoming administration, there probably will not be a major emphasis, if any, on DEI programs. Uh, as mentioned in the second bullet here, AI, machine learning technology, we think this will be an area of focus that the government continues to look at. Many local, state, and even federal government uh, legislators are looking at what AI is and does and how it can be regulated. We think the EEOC is continuing to push its software initiatives that may not go away. Uh, Commissioner Sonderling was very active in this space. It'll be interesting to see if any of the new incoming commissioners uh, after 2025 decide to pursue this, whether it becomes a hot button item for a new general counsel that, of the EEOC that gets appointed by Trump. But nonetheless, uh, this will be an interesting area to follow. And finally, as Jerry mentioned, and as we see every year, retaliation seems to be in the top three of complaints. Usually there's an action, somebody complains about it, and then necessarily the third part of that piece of the puzzle is the retaliation claim. Retaliation claims always seem to be around, they always seem to be popular. Uh, and people all oftentimes bring these claims in accompanying another claim of discrimination in a charge. And the anti-retaliation initiative between the EEOC, the Department of Labor or DOL, and the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, it'll be interesting to see if all of these agencies are able to harmoniously work together to try to eradicate retaliation. So let's look for a minute at the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. That act, of course, went into effect in June of 2023. This past year, though, in April of 2024, the EEOC issued its final regulation to carry out the law, and that regulation went into effect about five months ago on June 18, 2024. That law requires employers to offer workplace accommodations to employees who are pregnant or who have a condition related to pregnancy or childbirth, unless of course the accommodation would cause undue hardship. The examples in the guidance of possible reasonable accommodations though are expansive. They include everything from additional longer or more flexible breaks 
to changing work schedules, to telework, to temporary suspension of essential job functions, um, as well as temporary reassignment. Um, we also saw updates to the enforcement guidance on harassment in the workplace over the past year. April 29, 2004, the EEOC published this updated guidance. That guidance spans 150 pages with 387 footnotes, rich with more than 75 detailed examples of potentially harassing conduct, notably the expansion of protected characteristics includes a litany of things such as sexual orientation and gender identity. The guidance includes, it includes examples on misgendering, which it defines as repeated and intentional use of a name or pronoun inconsistent with an individual's known gender identity. Other examples cover harassment based on color, irrespective of race or nationality, as well as pregnancy, including lactation, childbirth, and reproductive decisions, including an example based on a decision to have a vasectomy. Um, the guidance also talks about harassment based on stereotypes, as well as harassment in the virtual workplace. So the guidance notes that harassment remains a key concern for the EEOC and that approximately 35% of the merits lawsuits it brought in fiscal year 2023 included a harassment allegation. So is the EEOC um, obtains funding, uh, which may be questionable, but we would expect a continued focus on this area in light of this sort of increased uh, focus on pattern and practice lawsuits alleging harassment in the workplace. So this is our final substantive slide, and I call this uh, the prognostication page. What in the world's going to happen and what should be in your toolkit in corporate America? Why, and I believe that corporate executives don't wake up every morning thinking about how they can discriminate against their talent and their workforce. Rather, they think about the great goods and services they can uh, offer to their customers and a great workplace they have for all of their colleagues uh, that are employed by the business. But that being what it, uh, it is, uh, you still have to deal with the EEOC, which has historically been one of the most activist agencies and litigation uh, intensive agencies in the United States. So the first uh, sort of uh, bullet point is gonna be what is gonna happen to the EEOC's budget request. Every year it goes to Congress, asks for more money, this year, it's going to be over $33 million, uh, but will that survive? Will the Trump administration allow that to go through, or will it actually cut the budget? We have a little bit of a, a history cycle with the uh, Trump administration in the first term, and what I saw happening there was to hold tight on budgets and to not fill positions and to allow uh, the EEOC to struggle to do its job because it didn't have enough manpower and didn't have enough money. So at the very least, look for that coming uh, as 2025 opens in terms of one way for uh, policymakers in the Trump administration to put a governor, so to speak, on the business of the EEOC. Then what about the actual functioning of the EEOC? One of the most important selections by President Trump will be of the new general counsel of the EEOC, which is a very important position um, at uh, that agency. Uh, it will be someone uh, that the president trusts and who more likely than not is completely aligned with the president's views on the role of the EEOC, uh, probably more as a business friendly and advisory body uh, than it is a litigation activist uh, body. There will also be the opportunity for the president to appoint open commissioners. There are five uh, commissioners. Uh, they all have staggered terms. And eventually during the uh, presidency of Mr. Trump, there will be three Republican appointed commissioners and two Democrats. Uh, right now it's three Democrats, uh, two Republicans. So there's going to be some tension there in terms of getting the business of the uh, EEOC done. So 
what is it going to look like and what are those predictions? My predictions are expect less scrutiny uh, by the EEOC in terms of looking inside uh, the four corners of a charge or what an employer is doing. Look for the EEOC to be more business friendly in terms of being a regulator. I think look for looser enforcement, not an absence of enforcement, uh, but looser enforcement, at least as compared to uh, the EEOC during democratic administrations. Uh, look for uh, less worker-friendly positions, but more of a moderating position as Republican majority policymakers uh, begin to take over and soften some of the regulations. I think importantly, there will be structural changes to slow the pace of litigation and uh, litigation will have less of a biting or hard edge in terms of some of the stretch the envelope cases brought by the EEOC during past democratic administrations. I think politically the EEOC will begin to push away from some of its positions on gender identity uh, discrimination and DEI efforts uh, to reflect uh, the Trump White House position. I think you'll see a slowdown on uh, government enforcement guidance and I think you'll see appointment of new commissioners that will try to turn the direction of the EEOC uh, tending towards the left, uh, more towards the right. And with that, I'll switch it over to Jen. Thanks, Jerry. So each year we publish the Dwayne Morris EEOC Litigation Review. This is a comprehensive review of filings, settlements, rulings, and the 2024 edition is available as an ebook, which you can access by scanning the QR code on the slide. Stay tuned for the new edition coming out in February of 2025. So thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we hope we've raised your uh, issue spotting uh, abilities in terms of all things EEOC and have a great weekend.